Welcome again. Right now we're at Acts chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. The unusual effects of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Now we just came from the previous passage, which talks about, you know, the famous day of Pentecost. You know, when the Spirit of God descended on the apostles, lots of things were going on. You know, we have the sound of mighty rushing wind, supernatural sounds. We've got the appearance of fire, you know, coming down upon the people, just like it was on Mount Sinai with Moses, okay? Awesome, awesome things happening here. Also, the apostles that never learned these foreign languages started speaking foreign languages that other people there understood, okay? You know, again, in context, we got a room full of people and it's an international meeting. There are people from all over the place, you know, there in the upper room in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, people from all different countries. And I'm sure there was people there that did not understand Hebrew did not understand Aramaic. So they were there nevertheless. But when the Spirit of God came the way he did on this particular day, it says the apostles started speaking languages that those other people understood. And this was an amazing, marvelous work of God. However, it goes farther than that, okay? Let's read it. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 12. They were all amazed and were perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Others mocking, saying, They are filled with new wine. In other words, they're drunk. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and spoke out to them, You men of Judea and all you who dwell at Jerusalem, let this be made known to you and listen to my words. For these aren't drunken as you suppose, seeing it is only the third hour of the day. It says here about 9 a.m. That is the third hour after sunrise, okay? But this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. Think about this for a minute, okay? Think about this. 120 people gathered. And the Spirit of God comes, like we said, it was lots of different things going on, okay? But it says the people who saw this said these people are drunk. Now, think about this for a minute. Here are the facts. 120 people in the upper room, supernatural signs and wonders. And then people who were saying, look, these people are drunk. Now, let me ask you a question. What does it look like to be in a room full of 120 people and they're all drunk. What does 120 drunk people look like all gathered together in one place? Think about this for a minute, okay? Some people said the only reason why they thought they were drunk is because they were speaking in tongues. But but wait a second. This is a room full of 120 people and it's an international gathering anyway, okay? When the apostles were speaking in tongues, They were just speaking in other languages that the other people understood. So in a room full of 120 people, and it's an international gathering full of people who speak all different languages, you are going to expect people to be speaking in other languages. So just the fact that people were just speaking in other tongues, you know, speaking in other languages, that's not enough for people to say, hey, these people are drunk, okay? I mean, put it this way. I mean, when the police are stopping people at the side of the road looking for impaired drivers, they're not looking for people who speak in tongues. They're not looking for people who speak in other languages. They're looking for people who can't walk the straight line, okay? They're looking for people who are really impaired. So what does 120 people drunk look like? Let me help you out. They're going to be boisterous. They're going to be loud. There are going to be a lot of people passed out. There are going to be a lot of people stumbling. There's going to be some people that are, they they can hardly talk. They're just slurred speech. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things going on there that looks really ridiculous, you know? know, There are going to be people laughing. There are going to be people shouting. There are going to be people hooting and hollering, okay? I mean, that's what 120 drunk people look like. That's what people look like when they get drunk, okay? So obviously, obviously, these are the kinds of signs that was going on in Acts chapter 2. 
These are the kinds of signs that we're manifesting. These are the kinds of effects that the people were exhibiting. It wasn't just people speaking in other languages and declaring the mighty works of God. I mean, if you were to walk into a room and there's 120 international people there and they're all speaking different languages and they're talking about God and they're speaking the mighty works of God, you're not going to say, oh, you're all drunk. No, you're, you're going to be like, oh, okay, there's a bunch of different languages going on here. But you're not going to say these people are drunk. Okay. Now, there are people that say, oh, there's no evidence of, of them acting like they're drunk here in Acts chapter 2. No evidence? This is evidence, okay? People were there who were convinced that they were drunk. They were saying, wow, these people are drunk, man. Look at them, they're drunk. That's evidence, okay? You just got to put your brain in gear a little bit here and think about what it actually looked like. Now, really, not that we need any more evidence, but for those of you who are not quite convinced, let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're talking about Hannah now. I mean, really, in the scriptures, now really, we should believe it if it just says it once. So let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, there was a certain man of Ramatham, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Yehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up out of the city from year to year to worship and to sacrifice to Yahuwah, or to the Lord, of armies in Shiloh. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Pinchas, Phinehas, priests of Yahuwah were there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he gave portions to Panina his wife and to her sons and her daughters. But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved Hannah. But Yahuwah had shut up her womb. Her rival, that would be Panina, provoked her severely to irritate her because Yahuwah had shut up her womb. So year by year, when she went up to Yahuwah's house, her rival provoked her. Therefore she wept and didn't eat. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Like, you don't need any sons. You got me, okay? <laughs> you've, got, you've got a husband that's worth more than ten sons to you. So Hannah rose up after they finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his seat by the doorpost of Yahuwah's temple. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to Yahuwah, weeping bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, Yahuwah of armies, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a boy, then I will give him to Yahuwah all the days of his life, and no razor shall come on his head. This is, of course, talking about the Nazarite vow. As she continued praying before Yahuwah, Eli saw her mouth. Now Chana spoke in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Get rid of your wine. Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have not been drinking wine or strong drink, but I poured out my soul before Yahuwah. Don't consider your servant a wicked woman, for I have been speaking out of the abundance of my complaint and my provocation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. Here is Hannah, or Hannah. Now she has obviously got to be near the temple or in the temple because Eli was there at the doorpost of the temple. Hannah was pouring out her spirit to God. She was pouring out, she was just pouring out her soul to God, okay? And as she was praying, she, you know, she was kind of, Praying to herself, her lips were moving, her voice was not heard loud. And as she was praying, you know, Ellie, the priest, was right there and he was very concerned. And he said, No, look at you are drunk. Get rid of your wine. It's like you shouldn't be drunk. And she's like, No, 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 you don't understand. I'm praying here, you know. And then Ellie gave her grace. So once again, 
You got to think about this. Think about this. Do you think that Hannah, do you think that Hannah was just sitting there with her head bowed just going, praying silently? Surely Ellie would have known that she's praying silently. Do you think that she was, you know, maybe standing, you know, in the presence of God and just kind of going, Ellie would have known she's just praying silently. If, if, it's, if it was just the movement of her lips, obviously it was a lot more than just her moving her lips. For those of you who study the scriptures, you know that the scriptures that we have is not very exhaustive in details. Take, for example, the book of Genesis. There is so much, so much in the book of Genesis that is not told us, okay? So many details that we would just love to have, but we don't, okay? The scriptures do not give us all the details. Remember what John the Apostle said. He said, look, it, I wrote you a book here. And I'm telling you, there's a lot more than what I'm writing down. I mean, there's so much, there's so much about just Jesus himself. Not even the world could contain all of the books that should be written about him. There's a lot more detail that we're not getting. You got to look at the circumstantial evidence. You got to look at the culture. You've got to look further than just the black and white ink you got on your page. Okay. What was it about Hannah that made Ellie say, you're drunk? If you see a woman by herself in the house of God and she's moving her lips, if that's all it was to it, everybody in their right mind would say, well, just leave her alone. She's praying. Even though you can't hear her, she's praying. There had to have been much more than that. Okay? Much more than that. Perhaps she was like, just like, perhaps she could hardly stand. Perhaps she could hardly walk. Perhaps she was stumbling around. It doesn't give us the details. All it says is whatever she was doing, Ellie thought she was drunk. Whatever she was doing, Ellie thought she was drunk. Okay. Now I know some of the critics of Acts chapter two saying, well, you, well, these people who said they were drunk, they were just mocking. No, they really thought they were drunk. They, they thought they were drunk, so much so that Peter had to correct them and say, no, listen, you think they're drunk? They're not drunk, as you suppose. There's something else going on that you don't know about. And that's the thing. There are a lot of people who go to church. There's a lot of people who believe, but they don't know about this stuff. They don't know about it. It's like it is a different language to them. I mean, it is. They don't know about it, okay? You know, some people say, you know, what happened there in Acts chapter 2, they weren't really acting drunk. I mean, loud, boisterous, stumbling around, laughing, shouting, hooting and hollering, yada, 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 everything you can imagine, passing out, whatever. I mean, no, they weren't acting like that because it says in the scripture over and over again, be self-controlled. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. <sighs> You got to understand, in context, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, but how to control yourself? Obviously, it's talking about self-control in regards to your impulse to sin. Because once, once again, if you look at it in context, okay, the whole scripture in Galatians chapter 5 about self-control being the fruit of the Spirit, it does the flip side of it talking about the works of the flesh. And, you know, Paul contrasts that with the works of the flesh talking about fits of rage and all kinds of stuff like that, acting out of fleshly evil impulses, okay? Being self-controlled in context is talking about controlling yourself in regards to sinful things, Fits of rage, murders, all kinds of other things that Paul lists in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 all the way through, okay? That is what Paul is talking about being self-controlled about. You know, not self-controlled in regards to your worship or prayer to God, okay? And this is what happens, okay? A lot of people, you can get so deep in prayer, you can get lost in God, so to speak. The Spirit of God can just come over you and you can appear drunk to people, okay? It can happen, and it does happen to people. Take David, for example. He's worshiping. He is dancing in a very undignified way. Again, you can use your imagination. 
How was David dancing? How was he dressed? He was dressed or dancing in such a way that his wife was very, very disgusted with him. Okay? So, again, you can pull out the self-control scripture, but hey, I mean, wouldn't you rather be in a congregation where people are worshiping God and receiving from God in a very wonderful way as opposed to people and services that are so dull and so boring, okay? It's better to be in services where people are accusing you of being drunk than to be in services that are so dull and boring. It's like you might as well just go to a graveyard. Then there's a scripture talking about being sober. Well, again, the word sober here is talking about being serious, okay? Taking things with sobriety. Taking the scripture soberly. I am all for being sober when it comes to the commandments of God, the law of God. Taking it seriously. Taking the word of God, taking the law of God seriously. That's what it's talking about, being sober, okay? You need to take it in context. And some say, well, you know what? To be filled with the Spirit just means, you know, just to sing and, you know, sing psalms to one another, sing spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord and encouraging one another. There are a lot of people who go to church and sing songs, and you know it and I know it. They are far from being filled with the Spirit. Okay? Now, that brings me to another point. There are people who idolize this stuff, okay? They fake being drunk. You know, they fake being filled with the Spirit. Let's stay far from that, okay? Let's stay far from all fakeness. Let's stay far from all hypocrisy. The number one sign of being filled with the Spirit, the number one sign of having the Holy Spirit is a holy life. The number one sign of having the Holy Spirit is a holy life. Doesn't matter how many times you laugh, cry, roll around, jump, swing from the chandeliers, shout, doesn't matter. If you walk out of that meeting and you go back to your life of sin or you live a double life, then shame on you. Don't claim to have the Spirit of God if you are that kind of an example to the world. Okay, The number one sign of having the Spirit of God in your life is having holiness in your life. Remember, He's a holy Spirit. And yes, don't be quick to judge. Don't be quick to judge that this is of God and this is not of God. This is of God. This is not of God. There is a lot of people that so equate their church or what they know of church with God. Well, I've never seen anybody shaking in my church. Therefore, it's not of God. Well, nobody shouts in my church. Therefore, people who shout, that's not of God. That's got to be something that's not of God. Don't be so proud of your church to think that anything apart from what happens in your little organized religion is not God. Okay? Because God is greater than organized religion. God is greater than your denomination. God is greater than your church, so-called church. By the way, if you call it your church, well, I believe it's your church. It's not God's church. You should, you should start saying God's church, not your church anymore. So don't be quick to judge anything as being evil, okay? You don't want to go into the category of blaspheming the Spirit of God. You don't want to get close to that. You do not want that, okay? And as you go, continue to seek God's face. Continue to keep your mind open to everything that God has for you, okay? I believe it's important to have an open mind but not a closed mind because after all, God is much greater than the human mind. Call on Him and He will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.